Well, hello again. Everyone doing good? Why don't you do me a favor and crack open a Bible. Grab a Bible. Don't wait. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Grab them. There's, all, there's Bibles all over the place. Then uh, don't shortchange yourself. Grab a copy of God's Word. If you don't own one, there's blue ones all over the place, and you can go ahead and grab one of those. And a lot of the verses, well, some of the verses, I'm going, we're going uh, heavy, heavy God's Word tonight. So there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of Bible, a lot of it's not going to be on the screen, just going to have to go along with me, uh, otherwise we'd be here for three or four hours. So I'm all in on that, but I don't think my wife back there watching kids is in on that at all. So I want to be able to have a place to go home to tonight, so I'm going to try to keep it relatively short. But grab a copy of God's Word and open it up to Luke chapter 14. Uh, we're going to continue on in our message series through this gospel, we've been doing it for, I don't know, 10 months already. We're only about halfway through. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're peppering some other stuff in along the way. But uh, I just want to uh, shed a little light on some of the, uh, for some of the new folks that are here, you may be wondering about the normal format of churches. Uh, we're not every church, so we're a little bit different in, in some of the things we do. Um, you're going to get a chance to worship God musically more when the message is over, we're going to take communion after the message, and then we're going to worship Christ, okay? So when we get done, I'm just going to, unashamed, I'm just going to say, don't leave. When the message is done, we're just getting warmed up. Don't leave, okay? So please hang in there. Uh, the other thing, too, you might have thought it was a little bit strange. Um, as the Revolution Band was up here singing, and they did a really nice job, right? Um, that doesn't happen everywhere, just saying. Um, we're blessed. But God is putting his church together perfectly. So, so but um, you notice there was no spotlights on. And the reason why we had no spotlights on this evening is because our prayer as a worship team, before you guys got in this room and, and got to, to, to come in together, um, we prayed that there would only be one, there would be singular focus in here tonight, and that would be, on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And so we want to make sure that the lights weren't on because we didn't want you to be looking at anyone up here at all. And we just wanted you to be thinking about Jesus Christ. And so uh, that continues, although we have lights on now, uh, but that's only because we want to be able to read our Bibles. Okay, so in a sense, our eyes are still on Christ if your eyes are in the Word of God, okay? So let's make sure we get there. Um, I will say this, I haven't been to every church in the country, but I know that, and I've fallen victim to this too at times, where I so badly want you to come and be a part of this thing, that what we'll do as pastors is we'll, um, we, will, we will preach things that are super, super good, because the more attractive Jesus Christ is, our mentality is, that if he's very attractive, not like physically pretty, but the person of, if he's attractive to you, that you'd want to come here, okay? And that makes sense, right? I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it kind of makes sense, right? If, if it's good, you're going to want to come, okay? Well, that's not tonight. Tonight, I'm coming at you, okay? I'm coming at you, and it's not going to be easy, and so I think that it would be wise if we would take a moment, even though Jessica prayed with us, I think we need to pray a little bit more, Right, because we need, we need, there's still some hearts in here that are a little bit rocky, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you knocked on them, that's what they would sound like, and they're not going to let this message in. So let's pray that away real quick. Can we do that? All right, so let's do that. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to, to submit to your, your eternal, perfect word. And, and Lord, we are thankful that you um, found us even worthy of hearing it. And, and, and worthy of submitting to it, and in some cases, worthy of suffering for it. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to uh, not overstep my bounds in any way, but to just be clear with your word, and I pray for every heart in here, including my own, that as your word goes forth, that our heart would receive your word and that you would truly be the Lord of our life. See, that's what we're looking for here, Lord. We're looking for you to be the Lord of our lives, not just some celebrity 
profile of some amazing guy from a long time ago, but that you would be the Lord of our life. And that is what we ask of you tonight, that you would help us to surrender to you and sit under the authority of your word. So help us as it is proclaimed over us tonight to submit to it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're just gonna talk about the next thing. We, like I said, we've been going for like 10 months going through Luke and hopefully you're growing and, and learning and I, I know I have. Uh, but we've been studying through the Gospel of Luke so that we could understand the truth because God said he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. So to get fired up, you got to have some truth, right? So the more you know about Jesus, the more fired up you are about him. So if you hear some truth here tonight and it gets you a little bit fired up for him, it's okay to express yourself, okay? If you start running around on the aisle back there doing cartwheels, I'm sending Joey after you. And he's big. So don't be going nuts over up in here, but if you get excited about Jesus, it's okay to holler or something like that. You know what I mean? It's okay to say no old Catholic church or something like that. We're going to have some fun up in here. All right, I don't know if anyone told you it's okay to have fun in church, but you can. Hi, Cameo! That's the number one thing you're not supposed to do. Don't embarrass people when you come to church. I heard, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute, Cameo. I heard you were singing today. Is that true? I, I heard she was good, too. Don't make me get a wireless mic down in there. We'll go down there and see you. Don't be running off. <laughs> Jessica, on it. <laughs> I don't even know where I was. So he wants us to worship in spirit and truth. So what we want to do is we want to just kind of go through the gospel of Luke and find out exactly what Jesus taught. Not what some preacher told you, not what grandma told you, not what Google told you, but what God's word says about who Jesus is, who he was, who he is, who he will be, who you are in him, what he actually said and taught and did. That's what we're looking for as we go through the gospel of Luke, Okay. What Jesus actually taught is to be obeyed and followed, okay? That, that, we could stand up here and, 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 and Pastor Tom and I could give you all kind of Greek definitions and it doesn't mean anything if you don't do what it says, all right? So, so theology is awesome and if you want to do that, we can set up some private time to, to go through the, the, the Latin Vulgate all you want. But the thing is, is that we need to open up the word of God and see what it says and do what it says, even if you feel like you don't want to, but you do it because you expect the best result and you want to be obedient. That's it. That's the goal here as we get up on stage and proclaim God's word to you. So tonight I want to talk to you about, so I'm going to start off here. I want to talk about something that's common in, in the Bible. It's, it's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. Do you know this, this expression, the kingdom of God, is used 68 times in the New Testament alone. So obviously it's like a big deal. Okay, the kingdom of God is used 68 times. Now, there's different, there's different perspectives within the Christian church, and, and I, this is a news flash, but Christians fight about stuff. No. Yeah. I've never heard about this, but... They say like they, they go on Facebook and argue about theology. Listen, I know no one in this church ever does that. Let me, let me back it up. No one in this church should ever do that, but Christians do fight about it. So there's some different um, camps, different tribes when it comes to a whole lot of different things. But in this thing, this, this kingdom of God, there's... There's this consistent view. The consistent view just means that, that God's kingdom is coming at some point. Right? It's coming at some point. So it's in the future. There's the realized view. So it's a different camp. They're slinging arrows at each other. But the realized view means that it's now. That God's kingdom is now. Is it a place? Well, um, it's not a place right now, is it? I mean, there's no, you know, when you think about a king, right? When you just, if, you could, if you would close your eyes for just a second and think of, of a king, right? I don't know, maybe Disney movies pop into your head or something. Maybe, right? I don't know. 
Yeah, like a king with a castle and a crown, you know, like little cartoons or something. I don't know what would pop into your head as a, when you think about a king. I don't know. King Triton, right? King Triton, because Candy's a mermaid. And, but I mean, right, you have different, different thoughts in your mind about what a king would look like, right? But there's a, there's a castle, and there's a moat around it, and there's alligators and crocodiles and all that kind of stuff, and there's knights and horses, and then beyond the castle, which is, of course, up on a hill, because it's Disney movies, and, and then around it is, is the villages and stuff, and that's the kingdom, right? Well, is God's kingdom a place? Well, no, no it's not. I mean, we, we know that. We know that nowhere on this earth is there one of those that I just described to you. Um, is, it, um, is it a rule or a reign of a king? Outside of geography? Well, I don't know. How about this? This might help. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God. See, there's a context here. It talks about that, that the Father knows everything you need. Like right here, present, right now. Anyone have needs? Okay. So God already knows what they are. And so what he says is, and, and Jesus is teaching this in, in, the, in the Gospels. He says, God, my dad, already knows everything you need. When you raise your hand, he already knew it. And so if you seek first the kingdom... All those things, you'll get them. He'll take care of that stuff, right? So he's saying, think of the chronological order here that's being displayed in the text. He says, seek first the kingdom. So get after this thing right now. Be a part of this right now. Like that's what you're going after. And then you'll get some stuff, right? So, so that's like now. Seek now his kingdom. Don't, don't, don't just wait till somewhere down the line when you croak that you'll be up there. Right? No, he's saying now. Seek the kingdom now. So it's, it's present. But at the same time, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 25, Jesus, he's drinking some wine. That's not an excuse, y'all. He's drinking some wine with his, with his homies, and he says that I'm not going to drink wine again until it's new in the kingdom. So he talks about now the kingdom and future the kingdom. King David says in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, he says, this is a long time ago, right? The, God, the, the, the New Testament was like 2,000 years ago. King, King David's like 3,000 or so, right? Long time ago. And he says to God, yours is the kingdom, right? He acknowledges the ultimate head presently. Yours, God, is the kingdom. Present, now, Right? But three verses earlier, in the Lord's Prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? Thy kingdom come is future. Anyone confused? A little bit of both? A little bit of both? See, I think that the Bible teaches that it's both. I think that the Bible teaches that it's both. I think that there's definitely a future kingdom where the totality of God's plan comes and, and is in effect. And it's not going to change. It's full. It's complete. We're not going to be looking forward to something else. This is it. And it all comes to a conclusion right here. This is as good as it's going to get. There's the kingdom established for sure. And we know this. Uh, John 14, 3 says, um, when, that's what, time, uh, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so you'll always be with me where I am. See, so there is a future time and a place. He says, when everything is ready. So that's not present. That's sometime in the future, right? When everything is ready, I'll come back to you and I'll take you to where I'm going to be. So you see, there's a future kingdom and it's in a place. That's what it says in the text. As a matter of fact, we see a little bit more uh, displayed or, or unveiled in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, Jonathan, say Amen. Okay, so Revelation 21, it says that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, right? So that's a place, and it's in the future, correct? And it talks about this holy city of Jerusalem that's going to be there. And only those people who have bent the knee to Jesus Christ, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, will be there. That's it. Only them. 
So there is a day coming when faithful and true will rip open the clouds, come down on a white horse, he'll have a sword in his mouth, his eyes will be like fire, his robe will be dipped in blood, he'll have a tattoo on his leg that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's going to unleash the full and fierce fury of Almighty God upon everyone who is not his. There is a day coming for that. And you need to be ready for it. And when that happens, he will set up an earthly monarchy. Something right here on this new earth where only he rules. And there'll be no opposition. And there'll be no more pain. And no more tears. And no more death. And no more sorrow. And all those things will be gone forever. It's a good kingdom. Listen, the human race has an appointment. Actually, it's got a deadline. Because if you don't cross the line of faith, you're dead. You see? It's coming. And, and everyone has to give an account. Every single person. And this appointment with Jesus Christ, not only is it coming, but nobody knows when it's coming. You see, Jesus Christ even says himself in Matthew 24, 36 that only the Father knows when this is going to happen. That should put a sense of urgency inside your guts right now because you don't know. It could come at the end of my sentence and you don't know. That's a little bit scary, but here's the part that's scarier. At least it was for me. You know, a lot of people have this perception of when Jesus comes, when, when he gets sick and tired of how ugly it is. Right, you've heard of this. Oh, it's getting so bad. Jesus must be coming. You've heard of this, right? It's kind of like this, that he's up there in heaven going, you know, he's like got a tab going like, oh man, they're really ticking me off. And then this day comes and it's like, oh my goodness. Can, does he say, oh my God? I don't even know. Like, what does he say? <laughs> so, right? So, so like, what is he, is he like getting to the point where he's so sick and tired of the human race that he finally goes, that's it, I'm tired of them. I'm wiping them all out. Like that's not what's happening at all by any means. You see, it's not that it's so bad. Oh my goodness, Jesus must be coming. No, no. Because the next verses say that he's going to come just like he did in Noah's day. When everything seemed fine. Everything seems fine. It said they were having wedding celebrations, partying, having a good time. You can see it in verse 37 and 38 of Matthew 24. After he says, only my father knows when it's going to happen, he follows it up by saying, oh, and by the way, you're not going to really even know because, see, you guys are going to think everything's fine. You're going to be having a good old time. And wham, unannounced, here I am. Are you ready? Are you ready? And see, that's what people don't understand. They think that it's got to get bad enough, and they're watching the news to see how this is all unfolding, and, oh, Donald Trump got elected, and, oh, he's the Antichrist, and Hillary is going, you know, whatever, dude. It's not, it's not about who becomes president. There's just a time, and it's, more, it's, not about, it's not about how bad we are. It's more about when does the gospel reach the last person? When the gospel reaches the end of the earth, then he's going to say, okay, you all had an opportunity to bow the knee to me, there's your opportunity, right? Okay, done. Boom, here I come. And, and, and listen, I don't know how educated, how fast your internet speed is, but you're not going to know when the last person gets the gospel. So you better be ready for it. I need to be ready for it. You need to be ready for it. Right here, right now. Well, somebody, would you please ask me, somebody please ask me, how do I get ready for that? Okay. It's so simple, and I'm so glad that you asked. That's all you need to understand is that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that you've broken God's law somehow, some way, and then you need him to help you. And his help is in the person of Jesus Christ the Lord who is a perfect Savior. He went to the cross. He paid for your sin. If you embrace him as your Lord and Savior, that that's your penalty right there on the cross, and you believe that with your heart, then you're saved and then you're ready. Okay, and you could do that. Listen, you could have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life right now if you want to. You just got to say yes to what I just said. That's it. It's that simple. You don't have to go to CCD. You don't have to go to Class 101. You don't have to give in the offering box. You don't have to do nothing. You have to do that. You have to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty of your sin. And that's it. And you can do that right now. You can do that right now. 
And listen, unashamed, when this service is over, they're going to be right there. And you don't know because you haven't been to church a lot. And you're like, well, I don't know how to do that. It's so simple. You pray. Just like you'd talk to the person next to you, you talk to God in that same way. It's called prayer. And you just pray. But if you feel uncomfortable with that and you want someone to kind of lead you, like, I don't know how to pray. I never prayed before. That's kind of weird. Okay, it is kind of weird. Because you don't see anybody. You're talking to someone, but you don't see them. It is weird. So they're going to help you. And if you want to pray and just say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, you can do that with them. And they'll be up there afterwards. You can, you can do that. Don't, listen, don't wait. Don't wait for the next service. Don't wait till you're good and ready. It could be tomorrow when everything's just going well. Like in the days of Noah, when all of a sudden it started raining. Ah, it could happen. So getting back to what we were talking about, the kingdom it isn't just a future time and a place. See, it's a present reality right now. Do me a favor and look in, ch in chapter 17 of Luke. Chapter 17 of Luke kind of talks a little bit about this whole uh, Jesus coming and ripping open the clouds and here it is and it's your last chance and you never know when it's coming. And so 17, 20, and 21 kind of talk about that. Where it's, it's Jesus teaching again and someone comes to him and says, you know, when will the kingdom of God come? It's a legit question, right? We're talking about the kingdom of God. Well, when's it going to come? And so Jesus replies, he says, listen, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. Like, you're not going to be able to kind of see this thing physically coming. You won't be able to say, oh, there it is, or it's over there. Look, there it is, right there. There's the kingdom. Like you would in a Disney movie where you see the castle and the king with his crown and the moat and the alligator. Like, you won't see that. But what does, he do, what does he say? So you won't be able to see it physically for the kingdom of God is already among you. And all, some translations say within you. And some of them say it's within your grasp. In other words, you haven't got there yet, but it's right here, right now. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. It's within your grasp right now. The gospel has been presented to you. You can say yes to it right now and be saved forever, right now. So the kingdom of God, bless you, is right here, right now. So you see, it's not just a, a future reality where he's gonna set up a physical kingdom here on this new heaven and new earth, but he's gonna, it's actually right here, right now, he says. And I would just say this, that where Jesus reigns, there his kingdom is, right? That, that's the bottom line. And it's not about geography. If he reigns in you, there his kingdom is in you. Do you understand? So it's both things. Yes, there's a future kingdom coming where it, it hits its fullness. But as of, it, as of right now, it's wherever Jesus reigns. See, there is a group of people that truly have Jesus ruling their life. See, they obey his word. They obey his commandments. They treasure his words. They are led by his spirit. See, right now, it's not necessarily a place, but it's a people with a king, right? So that's the kingdom of God. And I just want to say, uh, as we read, well, you know what, let me, let's, let's read this first. Let's read chapter, I don't want to say what I was going to say. Let's read chapter 14, and we're going to start here in verse 15. This is our main text. That was just an intro here. But chapter 14, verse 15 is, is, is where we're going to start. And, and Jesus was talking about sitting down at a banquet like you would have here, just like a potluck dinner here at the church, okay? So we're talking about a physical, right now, present reality of coming and just eating together, right, with Jesus. So this is what's happening here. And so one of the people there, he's hearing this about where you should sit and who you should invite. And don't just invite all the quote-unquote good people, but inv invite the people who, who are hurting and who can't really repay you. They can't, they, you know, it's like a potluck where everyone's supposed to bring something. Well, let's invite the people who can't bring anything. You know what I mean? Let's, let's, those of us that have a lot, let's, 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 let's cook a lot and invite the people who don't have anything so that we all have something, right? That's the whole book of Acts church right there in a nutshell. 
So let's do that. And so Jesus is kind of explaining that to them. And so here it says here in verse, verse 15, it says, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus explains, uh, he says this, uh, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And so see what, what, what this guy is saying here is that someday it's going to be so awesome to actually sit at a banquet in this new heaven and new earth and, and, and sit with Jesus and like have this banquet. And yes, there is this marriage supper of the lamb. That's for another time where there will actually be a feast in heaven. But this guy is, he's assuming that this dinner that, he's, that Jesus is at right now and talking about, this is good, but how amazing it's gonna be to attend that banquet in heaven, like this ultimate banquet. And so Jesus replies with a story because that, that, like, it is going to be awesome, but Jesus brings him right back down to earth for a moment because this guy's got, he's so heavenly minded, he's not thinking about right here and right now. And Jesus is like, no, I came that you might have life abundantly. Not life abundantly someday, it's right now, right? And so he, 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 he unpacks this whole idea of a banquet. So this is what he says, Jesus, in, in red. Y'all listening? Okay. Your phones are away? Okay. No one's on Instagram? Pinterest. Jared's on. Getting some creative ideas. Yeah. What's it? Knitting? Crochet. Yeah. I just want to, like, just have fun now. I don't even want to preach anymore. I just want to throw it right out the window. I know. He's a big talker, ain't he? I know. You do all the work. Did you sleep in today too? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got so much right now. Oh, my Lord. Okay. Oh, there's a time and a place. Oh, I don't want to be old Moses. Oh, okay. Let's read God's word. Okay. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began to make, making excuses. One said, I have bought, just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. He didn't even ask for an excuse. <laughs> He's like, I can't come. <laughs> Wife said no. <laughs> I said no, bottom line. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame after the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. So I guess some people had started coming, right? And he looked and said, there's still room for more. And so his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Um, I just want to be quite clear that participating in corporate church gatherings, like coming to church, is not the totality of the definition of the kingdom of God. I need you to understand that. But I also need you to do me a favor and touch the person next to you and say, but, but, there is, however, there is, however, in our text here in Luke 14, the clear reality that God wants his house full. Okay? He wants his house full. Right? And where Jesus reigns, there his kingdom is. Right? So, so this isn't, this isn't if I rip open the clouds and come and you haven't accepted me yet, then you're done. No, this is a, that's the future thing. This is a now thing. I want my house full. I want my house full. This is a now thing. Okay? So, Obedience to his word indicates kingship. Do you understand? Am I making myself clear? You, you can't, the Bible says that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. So if you choose to obey the clear directive of God's word, then God is your master. You could say Jesus is my Lord. 
But if you do not, you cannot call him Lord. Do you see what I was talking about earlier? I'm coming at you, right? This is stern, and this is not fluffy, happy, awesome, attractive Jesus. You should come to my church because it's so incredible. It may be that, but it's because it's the truth of the word that's attracting people here, not the, not the, not the message that's got flowers all around it, okay? This is the truth. It's a matter of obedience that decides the lordship of Jesus in your life. Look at, just a reminder here, look at verse 23. He says, so his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. That's what it says, right? Well, last week, I want to I focus on this word urge. Last week I told you uh, something from the scriptures where it said that tons of people were coming, right? And there, and Tons of people were starting to believe. The church had just started, and people were starting to believe, and many were brought to the Lord. Remember I shared that? And I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about that this week. Okay, many were brought to the Lord. I want to commend those that brought someone to the Lord today, because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to bring people to the Lord, right? And it says right here, urge them, urge anyone. Some Bibles would say, compel them to come to the house of the Lord. That, that's what it would say. Now listen, compel and urge is what we should do. It, it implies that you have to give them reason to want to come here, right? You have to, you have to be um, intentional about this thing. You, you have to give them reason to come. You have to put some effort into this. Like, urge and compel is more than just wearing a revolution t-shirt. I think that it's great that we have bumper stickers. And I think that it's great that we have t-shirts. And I think it's great some of you even put a sign in your yard. Now that's starting to get a little bit more aggressive because that's not normal to do that, right? So, so when, you, when you start to do those things, that, that's really good. But, but, but let's go beyond that for a second. I think we should all have those things, wear your t-shirt everywhere and all that, because it strikes up conversations. But listen, you've got you've to urge them to come. That means you've got to tell them why they should come here. You've got to give them a reason why life at Revolution Church and to be a part of this thing is awesome. And you've got to give them reason to want to come right? You have, to, you have to be different. You have to give them a reason why they should come here. Why are all other things not as good as going to church? And maybe it's not just this church. Maybe you're visiting from another town and this is not your church. That's fine. Whatever your church is, if it's a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, urge people to come there. Urge people to come there. It's good news. They need to hear it. Many were brought to the Lord. And he wants us, look at the master. I mean, does anyone want to venture a guess on who the master is yeah right god and and what does it say when we don't do this when the people aren't coming what what happens he gets furious like this is no game man right we make it a game but it's not a game it's it, god gets furious well, that's what it says we have to urge people to come um I think it's awesome when you invite a friend. And I think you should do that more. But let's get beyond the superficial. You should check out my church. Urge them to come. Compel them to come. Do something out of the ordinary to let them know that there's something valuable here that they need so that they'll come. That's what he wants, right? That's what we should do, but what we should not do is displayed in verses 18 through 20, and it addresses the vast majority of people who profess that they are Christians, but treat corporate church services as optional in priority and, more importantly, in practice. Did you know that even though, I, I, I said this a moment ago about the lordship of Christ and the obedience to Christ and whether he's your king or not, did you know that Hebrews 10.25 tells us to not neglect meeting together. It, not to neglect this thing that you're doing right now, right? And you've got to understand the context of when this was written, right? This isn't written like last Tuesday. This was written thousands of years ago. This is written on the heels of the church being birthed 
And if you've read in the book of Acts in any, at all, which you, if you come to this church, you've, you've heard it, they met every day. They met every single day. They met in the temple, and then when we got done, we went to houses, and we broke off into other groups, and we did more, and we worshiped more. That's the context that the Bible's written in this New Testament, in the context of daily worship. But yet, less than half of professing Christians in America don't even go to church once a week. Once a week. You feel it? They won't even go once a week. Most professing Christians in this country maybe go to church once a month. One, it's not important enough to them because we invest in the things that we think are important, right? And two, we have no lordship. So we say we are, but the Bible, God's word says, do not neglect meeting together. What is it described as in Luke 14? An excuse. That's cool. Christ followers... Yeah. So when it says something, we're supposed to do it. Listen, this is not to shame you. This is to give you a fresh start right here, right now. You can make a new choice right here, right now. That you're going to be a follower of Christ. And when you open up his word and it clearly says something. You know some things in the Bible kind of mysterious. How about this? Do not neglect meeting together. Does anyone in this room not understand what that means? Because we can pause for clarity. Okay, so there's no more room for excuses, right? It just says that. In the context of meeting, God's word was telling them, meet every day. So let's just see if maybe we could hook up on Saturday nights in ink. You know, we experience that here at Revolution, although I think it's probably better than most. But I can tell you that, and it saddens me, that when you, if you walk into my office, on the right-hand side of my desk, I have a pile of Connect cards. You know, Mike always talks about filling out these cards so we can connect with you and call you and see how we could serve you and, and all that. And I can't tell you, I could, I could show you the pile of, of people that you get the card and you read it, and it's like they, when they, according to what they wrote, that they just walked into the greatest thing that's ever happened on the face of the earth. They, oh, you know, if you, you could hear it in their writing, oh, it's the greatest church of all time. Oh, the music was great. Oh, oh they say, glory, glory, hallelujah, right? Where are they? Most of them in the pile don't ever come. And, but, but, but then the next group of people are the ones who come once in a month or so. So it's not like it's not happening here. But I can tell you this, that group is missing out on something. Because those of us that are in this room right here right now that make, that have church attendance and participation on their calendar in ink, can clearly elaborate to you the joy and benefit of such a commitment. The, the, the greater understanding of God's mystery and his word, greater relationships with the people that are in the church, right? I want, I, I want and the leaders of this church, we want your, your church experience to be rich, and deep and fulfilling, right? Not just come in, listen to someone holler and say, hey, good, good message, preacher, and crack me in the rear end and go home. Like, I don't even care if you say that. I just want you to love Jesus and love each other, yeah. right? That, that's what the church is supposed to be. Yeah. And listen, that is never, ever going to happen if you come and hang out with these folks once every month or so. Would that work with your spouse? Why would you think it's going to work here? It doesn't. It doesn't. If you've ever, if you've come to this church because your last church was unsatisfying and unfulfilling, I'm just going to venture to say that you probably didn't buy in and get involved as much as you should have. 
And I'm not telling you to leave here and go back, but if you must, you must, and that's okay. Because this is Jesus' church. It's not mine or anyone else's. It's his. And we're all one church. But you, your, your church experience is only going to get better if you make it better. I can tell you right now, maybe I'm the only one, you know, with the guts enough to say it, that we're all terrible, man. And if you think your church experience is going to be incredible because we're coming after you, forget about it. Because we're not. What church ever does? They don't. It's only as good as you make it. The church is only as awesome as the people that are in it. Right? And the church is only as dynamic and outreaching to the lost world as the people who are in it are committed to such a task. And that's it. So let's go over the excuses. And listen, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you unashamed. And if you never come back here again, that's all right. This is what it says. I'm not the author. You ready? Okay. And some of you have heard some of this before, but I'm going to be, I'm going to be faithful to the text. And we talked a little while back, maybe a month ago, about some of these things. Remember where it says the cost of being disciple and foxes have dens? And a place to lay, but Jesus doesn't even have a place to lay his head and let me go bury my father and let me go visit my family. And he's like, no, you do that stuff. You're not even fit for the king. So we talked a little bit about this, but I'm not gonna just skip over this because it's kind of similar. Well, if Jesus thinks that this is important enough to repeat to these people, I think it's kind of okay for me to do it. So I'm gonna be faithful to the text. So here we are, we're in, we're in Luke 14. We read it, but just gonna pair, pull it apart. So there's a couple of things, there's some, there's some excuses and, and, and here they come, directly right at you. Here's the first excuse. It's material gain and distraction. Material gain and distraction. Look at verse 18. He says, uh, they all began making excuses, and here's this one guy. He says, uh, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Yo, check this out, right? Look what I got. Check this thing out over here, man. I'm a landowner. I'm a land baron. I got a ranch. Look at I got. Can you, can you just kind of see his strut as he go, examines his kingdom? Hey, look at my land over here. <sighs> right? You see it. All proud, sticking his chest out. Look at I got over here, man, you know? I can see it. We can make fun of that guy, but are you prone to doing the same kind of thing? Are you prone to idolize the stuff in your life? Are you all too often making the enjoyment of your gain the focus of your time and your attention? Rather than coming to God's house to thank and praise the stuff provider. That's what we gotta do. The Bible would say, and it's so true, what is it that you have that you have not received? And why would you, why would you boast as if you have not received? So you see the guy with his land, look at I got over here. Right here, I'm from Texas, man. Look at that land. Look at I got over here. And, and, and what is it that you have that you've not received? And why would you boast? Like, look at my land. Look what I have acquired. Look at I got. Look at me. Why would you boast as if you have not received it? You, you think because you're rich that you, you know, I don't know if I've ever, I, I think I may have shared this story before, but um, I'm going to just share it again. It's worth sharing. And many years ago, um, just throwing it right out there, when I got divorced, and some people are going to run, but whatever. Get over it. Get over yourself. But, you know, so, so when I got divorced, my house went into foreclosure. And my ex-wife, she said, well, we, 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 we ought to get a rental before they come and, because, you know, when they finally foreclose, they just put a lock on the door, like, you're done, right, you know? And I've, known, I've, I've known some people that that's happened to. So she's like, well, we just got a tax return. While we have money, let's get a rental. And I didn't want to. I wasn't ready to quit yet, but I gave in to my master, sad to say. We went and got a rental. And I was getting all these calls from Chase all the time. And I would start dodging the calls. You guys have done it. Come on now, right? And I dodged them for months because I knew they were going to do the same thing over and over again. Okay, Mr. Robbins, what happened? Okay, Mr. You know, they're just trying to get blood from a rock. I got no money, 
you know. So what's the sense? Now, I had been a car salesman. I was selling cars, making a lot of money, and I had bought this house because I had made a lot of money. I was able to do that. <clears throat> I was pretty proud of myself. It was the first house I ever bought, but now the house is in foreclosure, and I'm moved out, and I'm in a rental. So one day, this, the phone call comes, and for some reason, I picked it up. And I never picked it up when it was Chase, but I picked it up, and this lady named Erna, I'll never forget her, this lady named Erna answers the phone, and she asked me the same questions. And I don't know why, but I just, I just went along with it. She's like, well, what happened? Why don't you pay? Da, da, da. And I told her that I, was, I used to be a salesman, but now I'm a pastor of a church, and I really don't make any money anymore, and this and that. And she goes, whoa, 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 stop, hold on a second. You're a pastor of a church? And I said, yeah, you know. She goes, well, then why would you give up? I'm like, hammer, dude. It wasn't long after that. I'm just, I'm balling, right? She gave me a righteous rip down on that phone. She goes, well, why would you quit? Moses didn't quit. Jesus didn't quit. Why would you quit? I'm like, you, like they're not supposed to talk about that stuff at Chase, right? <laughs> Calls are recorded. It was amazing. She goes, listen, listen. She goes, this is what I need you to do. I don't even know why I'm telling you this, Mr. Robbins, but you need to go back to that house. You still have the key? Yes. You need to go back to that house. You need to get down in the living room and for three days, for two hours a day, just you and your Bible, you need to ask your heavenly father what to do with that house. You think you, she goes, you think you got that house? He gave you that house. I was like, what? I'm just bawling my eyes out. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's that saith the Lord, right? So I, I'm a stubborn, stiff-necked Hebrew, so I didn't go the first day. But I went the next three, and it was obvious that God had given me that house. And so I moved back in, and she moved back. She moved out. But I got that house still. I got that house still. And they, re, they modified my mortgage two times. And my second mortgage, you guys know, there's a lot of you, if you're a real close friend of mine, you know that my second mortgage, I got a letter in the mail one time a couple years ago, it says your $83,000 second mortgage is waived. You don't owe us this anymore. Like, what is that? I never applied for nothing. I never signed up for some Obama program or something like that. Never did it. It, it just came in the mail. You pull my credit. It's like that loan was bought and paid in full. That's crazy, right? So, so, so what do you have that you have not received? right? And so this landowner, I got to go check out my kingdom. Why, what do you have that you have not received? And why are you boasting as if you've not received us? You know, Paul, he elaborates on this even more. In Romans chapter one, he's, he tells us what we're all prone to do. And that is we begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. See, that's what we do. That's what we're prone to do as human beings. And so let me just say this, that using or enjoying something that the great gift giver gave you should never, ever trump coming to God's house to worship him. Amen. Never. Amen. Never. Honey, we got a new car. Let's go cruising. Absolutely. As soon as church is over. <laughs> Honey, I just got a, a, a bonus for Christmas. I'm taking you out for dinner. Awesome. Awesome. We'll go to Sunday brunch at Golden Corral after church, right? That's what we're supposed to do. So when we receive something from God and his grace is upon us, it's not to be used as an excuse to blow off the house and blow off the Lord to come and thank him for the provision. Okay, so that's the first one. <clears throat> Wipe up the blood. Here comes the next one. Verse 19, it's work. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. See, that's not like, I bought a ferret, I want to play with it. Oxen were work, they were tools, they were work. Beasts of burden, right? Oxen. And so he wants to go work, he wants to go plow the fields, right? <clears throat> Human beings have a tendency to go to extremes, right? Um, we're given food, we overeat. We're giving, we're, we have alcohol, we overdrink. We don't just have a glass of wine with dinner to calm our belly and it goes good with this, like to have a, a glass of wine. No, we just get hammered, stupid. That's just what we do. Everything has like a scale, if you will. You know, we drive too fast. We drive like a grandpa. 
We talk too much, talk, 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 talk. And then there's the one who doesn't communicate at all. And then there's the one who suppresses every bit of anger and resentment and tucks it all back in and never communicates the problem. And then there's the volcano who just explodes and you got to walk on, on eggshells around him or her because at any second he's just going to lose it on you. Right? There's some people that never pray. And then there's some people who pray all day and do nothing about it. It's just the way we are as human beings, and it's the same thing with work. There's two groups of people. The first one's the lazy person who will not work, okay? God's Word has a lot to say about this person. I'm going to share that with you. And if it's you, let God's Word crush you. Pro, uh, Proverbs 10.4, lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. I understand if you're working hard, you might not be like rich, but, but they gain something. There's something there when you work hard. There's a reward for this thing, right? Maybe we're not, you know, Donald Trump rich or Bill Gates rich, but we're not broke because we're lazy, right? We're supposed to work. Uh, Proverbs 12, 24, work hard and become a leader, be lazy and become a slave. Which one would you rather do? How about this one? Proverbs 13, 4. Lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Right? He's not excited about lazy people. And God's word is clear not to be lazy. And so you might be hearing that going, well, I ain't that guy. I'm not that guy. Well, God's word has something to do, something to say about that guy too. The guy who's saying, I'm not that guy, and I'm gonna, so he goes to the other. He runs to the other extreme. Work, 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 work. God's word has to talk to you too. Heed it. Psalm 127 too. It is useless. Someone say useless. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night anxiously, I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta work, I, 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 work, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Matthew 6, 33, I've shared it with you earlier. He knows what you need, right? He knows what you need. And if you'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll give it to you. So, so it's, it's what? useless. Like, if, I, if I'm going to put in a full day's work, I want it to mean something. So I hate the fact that if I was going to work all day, that the king of the universe would tell me that my efforts were useless. And if you're working day and night, like it says, it's useless. You're killing yourself for no, I mean, I'm just reading, did I, are you looking at your Bible? That's what it says, right? Anxiously, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat. Anxious, 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 uh, right? But he says he gives rest to those he loves. Like, you don't have to be frantically, oh, I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta, oh, I gotta do this, because if I don't, I'm gonna eat, I gotta, right? No, no. He says, I'll take care of that. That's rest. That doesn't mean rest in your rocking chair all day and be a lazy bum. He says lazy people will be bums. He says work. But don't do it anxiously thinking you have to do this all day to provide when he says, I got this. Amen. Right? That's what it says. Here's another one, Proverbs 23, 4. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Read it. I'm not making it up. And there's both ends of the spectrum in every single church. All that to say this. Like all other things, there's a balance. Never be lazy, nor work like crazy. And never, say never, should work stand in opposition to gathering in God's house to worship him and thank him for the work. 
to thank him for the provision that comes from the work and for the skills and the ability and the strength that he provides so you can do the work, right? Never let the work that he's given you and the ability to do it stand in opposition to knowing when to quit and getting to God's house to thank him for the job, to thank him for the skills, to thank him for the strength. That's what he wants for us. He says, get to the house and know when to quit. Some of us need to hear that. And I hope you'll heed God's word. Here's the third one. Family. We joked about it. I just got married, can't come. <laughs> He's not even asking for permission. My wife said I can't come. He didn't say, please excuse me, I can't come. <clears throat> Listen, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Submit to your husband in all things as unto the Lord. Where was the amens there? I heard the first one. You can't, this is not Bible buffet, yo. You got to pick it all. Jared, you ready? Submit to your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. That's the Lake County amen right there. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you guys are cool. <laughs> My wife told me I can't come. <laughs> Teach and discipline your children. Care for widows and orphans. You know, some of us are going to be charged to caring for a mother-in-law, a father-in-law for a long time. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to love our wife. We're supposed to respect and honor and submit it to our husbands. That's love from a wife. We're supposed to love our children by teaching them and disciplining them. Family is important, and God's word would call it a blessing. And so what I'm about to share is kind of difficult when you, in light of that, I shared this a couple, maybe a month ago, but if you look in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, right after this that we read, he says, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, now this translation's good because it actually explains it well, because it throws in this by comparison thing. And most translations don't have that. It just says you have to hate your family if you want to be my disciple. And so Greek people would understand this with the word that's used, that it meant to love less than Jesus, love your family less than Jesus. But in America, we would have a hard time understanding that because it gets translated hate, and that's not good. It's a bad translation because it's contrary to what God's word already says, which I just explained to you. How do you hate your wife when Jesus also says, love her as I've loved the church, right? You can't. So obviously hate is a bad translation. But it says clearly that we are to love Jesus more than we love our husband, our wife, our mother, our father, our children. Jesus first and best and then the rest, all the time. I just got married, so I can't come. Listen, if you've, the Bible says that if you have found a wife, you found a treasure and you found favor with the Lord, right? And if we have children, it says that children are a gift from God. And so just like the other, just like your stuff, your material, and just like work, Family should never be a reason to ditch church, but a reason to get to God's house and thank him for the family that he's given you, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Someone clap, please. Listen, over the past 20 or 30 years in the church, there's been this rebellious ideology that since the church is the people, and it is, it's the ecclesia, it's the called out. There's, there's the population of the world, and then there's the Christians. We're, we're, we're different, we're out of that whole thing, we live in it, but we're not supposed to live that way. We are a people. But because the church is the people, not the gathering place, then gathering at church somehow has been shuffled down and not important anymore. And you know this to be true. Well, if enlightenment thinking, which is me in the middle and my needs first, my desires first, 
If that's what leads you, then yes, that's true. But if the Holy Spirit leads you, then weekly and daily gathering will not be met with excuse. It will be done. It will be done. If you're a Christian who's letting God's Spirit lead you, then you will heed the Spirit's word. Don't make excuses. God clearly says, I want my house full. You're sitting in it right now. So if you've decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life right here, right now, and obeyed this and you're here, kudos, that's good. So I'm speaking to those that are watching me on Facebook Live. I love you. God wants his house full. He don't want your living room full or your recliner full. He wants his house full. And so, come. And I'm speaking to you too because next week's coming. Dun, 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 dun. Tick tock, tick tock, it's coming. Saturday's on the horizon already. Listen, if, I, if, if God, you want God to be hanging out here and, you want, and listen, you want me to, to be studying and prepared, give me someone to talk to. Give God someone to talk to, right? Give God someone to talk to, right? He wants his house full. Can I get the worship band to come back up here? Let's, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna take communion. We're gonna worship God, okay? We're gonna worship him. He wants his house full. Well, it's, it's pretty full. And so we're gonna be able to, to worship him now. So stop making excuses. He wants his house full. But listen, I wanna take you to a new level though. I don't want you to just stop making excuses and put coming to God's house in ink. But I want you to be someone who urges and compels others to do the same, right? See, he doesn't want you to make excuses. So next week is coming, right? Monday night's coming for prayer. Wednesday night's coming for vertical, right? Um, Thursday, uh, to, I mean, um, Saturday, the, 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 the ladies were here this, today. It's coming again next, next month, right? So, so there's opportunities to gather in God's house to honor him, build relationship with him, build relationship with one another, to sit under the authority of God's word being preached. And he wants you to not only stop making excuses, don't let family get in the way, don't let work get in the way, don't let your material gain get in the way, but stop making excuses and fill the house and then urge and compel others to come intentionality on purpose give them reason to want to come how good of an example is it when you listen I know some people have have urged and invited they've urged and invited someone to come to church I think that's awesome and they came and when they got here the person that invited them was not here what message does that send I'm not here to condemn. I'm just, this is, I, this is the life that I'm living. I'm here. All, this is what I do. So I see this stuff. What message is it to the person you invited to come to tell them it wasn't important enough for me to be here? Man, churches aren't having this kind of dialogue. They're not having this, converse, this straight up conversation. But we got to have this. If we're going to be a real church of Jesus Christ, then we got to have this conversation. We gotta, be, we gotta be faithful, not making excuses anymore, urging and compelling others to come and, and fill the house. Come to God's house often. God wants his house full. I don't want you to leave. We're gonna start by singing a little bit. Actually, why don't you just sit and relax and let the Revolution Band sing and let God sing over you. And in just a few moments, we're going to have a few people come forward and we're going to pass out the communion elements. And I want you to hold on to them. And then I'm going to come up here. I'm going to take communion together as a family and then sing another song to kind of close out our gathering tonight. Is that cool? All right, so let's stay right here. Lord, I thank you for um, 
I thank you for allowing me to be bold, to be able to, to preach your message from your word. I thank you for these hungry and eager hearts ready to receive and ready to live out and obey what they've heard. Lord, I look forward to, to the results of this. I, I, I am grateful, as, as I know many of us are, uh, of what you've already done and what you've built here and what you're continuing to build. But we're excited to, to see what you're going to do with this. New levels of commitment. New levels of lordship in our lives. Awesome. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, that we can be a church that that really desires the truth of your word so that we can worship you in spirit. We want the truth. And so I personally, Lord, I just want to personally thank you for everyone on the stage, everyone in the back, all these folks right here that you've brought here tonight to hear this message from your word. And I'm excited, Lord, to see the change that it's going to cause in their life. And therefore, in the life of this church, therefore in the life of this community and therefore in this world.